I'm going to share with you the uh, two passages that are going to be instrumental uh, in the sermon today. Uh, one is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. And then the second reading is from the book of James, which, of course, as you all know, we have been spending a lot of time with. All right, this is chapter 2. Uh, Chapter 2, verses 14 and 18. What does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but has not works? Can his faith save him? And then verse 18. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. Now, I wanted to start out uh, the sermon, uh, going back to the fact I was a teacher, I'm going to start out with a quiz. <laughs> October 31st, 2017, is going to be a very special day, and I'm just wondering if there's anybody here who knows the significance of October 31st, 2017. That's next year. Anybody have any ideas? All right. It will be the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. So it was on October 31st in uh, 1517 that Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis and that was considered the beginning of the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church in the 1500s was both spiritually and politically powerful in the Middle Ages. The papacy had become actually a little more political than it actually was religious. And it had become rather corrupt. Martin Luther came along the scene about this time. He was a scholar studying the law. And, and, uh, then he had this life-changing experience. Well, this kind of, kind of make him do a little soul searching. And so he, he promised God that he would serve him. And he went on to become a monk. But he didn't give up his, uh, his studies. He was very much a scholar. He went on to receive his doctorate. Well, Luther was disturbed by some of the abuses that had uh, come along during the Middle Ages in the Roman Catholic Church. And specifically, one of those that received a lot of attention, but by far it wasn't the only one because he posted 95 theses, so he had quite a number of different issues that he was dealing with. But one of these was something called indulgences. Now, at that time, the Pope had permitted uh, some people to go around giving out what were called indulgences to raise money to build St. Peter's Cathedral. Well, we all know that St. Peter's is a rather magnificent cathedral and certainly well worth building. But we do have to kind of question the method here. Uh, indulgences were actually um, uh, teaching that 
you would get assurances of complete pardon of sins and the release of beloved ones from purgatory. There was a man in Germany called Tetzel, and he had permission from the Pope to sell these indulgences uh, to help build St. Peter's. So he gave these assurances of complete pardon of sins and release of loved ones, and he had a, a rather famous saying in his time. When he would collect coins, he would have this metal container. And he said, as soon as the gold in the casket rings, the rescued soul to heaven springs. Had a certain ring to it, didn't it? Well, this, in Luther's eyes, w was not a proper teaching. And so that's what motivated Luther to post his 95 Thesis on the castle church in Wittenberg. One of his uh, main ideas in his 95 Thesis is that we are saved by faith alone. That was the scripture in Ephesians that definitely says we're faith, saved by faith. Well, in Luther's time, there was this common notion that you, you were able to go to heaven by doing good works uh, and basically do more good than bad, you know, if, if you had sort of like gaining brownie points. But Paul taught that we are saved by grace, God's unmerited goodness to us. By nature, we are sinners separated from God. And Jesus' death on the cross bridged the chasm between us and God. By faith, we confess our sins and God forgives us. I always sort of like to picture this as, as someone putting on a coat. And that coat of righteousness, when God looks at us, looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, he sees this coat that's covering us because God has forgiven us of our sins. If we could save ourselves, then we could boast. We could say, well, look at me. I did all these good things. You know, I deserve to go to heaven because I'm so good. But the fact is, we can't earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to God's favor. Therefore, we are saved through faith alone. Now, that brings me to James. For Luther, he had a little bit of problem with James. He had a hard time reconciling James to being saved, by faith, being saved by faith alone. But you know, we have this, this sort of a continuum here. Uh, th there's a certain point of tension, and uh, we have both of them come into play. So Luther was very heavy on the side of faith, and then he was having a little trouble with, with the works part. James, on the other hand, seems to push works and, and a little less on the faith side. But I think that there is an honest tension between faith and works, and it has actually been an issue all along the years, ever since the Reformation. The seeming contradiction is really a part of the mystery of the Christian faith. They are both strong factors. They are both necessary. You really need both. It's sort of like the old song, horse and carriage, horse and carriage. You can't have one without the other. Uh, faith and works, they do go together. Now, we see in, in our culture 
uh, groups that kind of uh, tend to lean one way or the other. For example, the evangelical churches tend to lean more on the side of faith and less on works, and many of the mainline uh, churches tend to lean a little more on the works and a little less on the faith. Now, I'm not saying either one excludes the other, but a case of a sort of a leaning. But the point is, both of these are really, really important. Now, Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love God, faith, and love your neighbor, works. So, once again, we come down to both of these coming into play. If we love God, we want to please God. And I think this is, this is where... Um, one aspect of this is, is that when we, when we become uh, Christians, when we really learn to love God and we want to please him, I think one of the things that it means is that then we should avoid sin. Now, you know that we're living in a, in a time period in which the word sin is not in big favor. Uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about it. It's like, oh, well, we've got beyond that. Well, frankly, I don't think we have. I think sin is still a factor that we have to deal with. And if we deny it, is say, well, we can't talk about it because it isn't politically correct or it isn't cool, then we'll have a tendency to err on the side of overlooking it. Now, I think we all recognize that there are situations in our own country where evil has reared its ugly head. Um, we can think of Columbine, Newtown, uh, Oklahoma, a lot of these situations where people have done things that, that are very evil and that's within our own country. Now we're dealing with it internationally, with ISIS. Um, frankly, I have a really hard time wrapping my arms around their approach, thinking it's okay to go around killing innocent people, and then on top of that, thinking it's okay to take a whole bunch of people and stick them in front of your soldiers as a human shield. To me, that is totally evil. Well, today, generally okay to talk about the Ten Commandments sins, such as lying, stealing, murder, those, those are pretty well still accepted. But then we come to the one about swearing. Well, not so much now. Our society has become rather crude. The way people talk in our society has become rather crude. Now, some of you are old enough to remember when mothers used to talk about washing your mouth out with soap. <laughs> well, it wasn't considered okay to talk foul language back then. Yet, there are some things that we don't hear much about in this day and age from the pulpit. We don't hear about infidelity. Well, you know what? That's a sin. You get married, you need to be faithful. And I don't know what kind of rationalizing you can go through not to understand that that's a sin. And then one that's really become really rampant in our society, pornography. Do you know that the most viewed sites on the internet are pornographic sites? And yet, we say, oh well, you know, 
So that, that's a sin that doesn't hurt anybody but the person that practices it. Well, that's not true. Because I've read about uh, a lot of marriages that have been destroyed because of that. Because what it does to the person. Now, I would hope that nobody here is going to be able to sit at home and rationalize that one away. Uh, that is not right. That's not a thing we should be doing. And of course, we all know about prostitution. I don't need to say much about that. You know, that's still considered not appropriate. But then, we get on something like gossip. Oh, okay, now you're meddling, right? Gossip <laughs> is a sin. Uh, and it's done an awful lot of harm. And, and we as Christians, we need to be aware of this within ourselves. Along with gossip, verbal abuse. Uh, we talk about physical abuse as being awful, and it is, but verbal abuse can do just as much, just as much harm. Now, there is a, there is a sin that uh, is mentioned in the Catholic Church that we don't mention much in the Protestant Church, and that's gluttony. Uh, Catholics consider that a sin, and some of us kind of close our eyes to it. But you know what? We need to be aware of that. Then, be a cheerful giver. This goes along with practicing our faith. Money reflects your heart, your beliefs. And I always found it interesting that the people were really critical of somebody getting up in the pulpit talking about money. But let's be honest. Your value system determines how you spend your money. And if God is important to you, then you're going to spend money in his direction. And you're not going to feel like, well, they shouldn't get up there and talk about money. Be a cheerful giver, the Bible says. So, works through love your neighbors as yourself. That's definitely very much a part of Bible's teaching. Love God and love your neighbors yourself. And I think about, from a historical perspective, how that really manifests itself in the uh, 1800s in our own country. There was a movement called the Second Great Awakening. It was in the early 1800s in the United States. And out of this came three important social issues, all of which were motivated by the people that got caught up in the Great Awakening. Abolitions, abolitionists, that movement came directly out of the Second Great Awakening and became, of course, very prominent in the whole thing about the Civil War. Now, granted, the Civil War didn't start as uh, to free the slaves, but it certainly ended up in that direction. Then, Women's rights. That movement actually started from, from the Second Great Awakening. Now, it took a while before it went full force, you know, and uh, women got to vote in the uh, early 1900s. Then there was a third one that was well-meaning, but didn't end up working out quite the way we wanted it to. Temperance, the temperance movement came out of the Second Great Awakening. Because in those 1800s, there was a serious problem with drunkenness. And so people that came through that saw the relationship there and how that shouldn't be a part of a, a Christian person's uh, life. But obviously when we, when we pass the uh, 
the legislation in this country, it didn't quite work out so well. Then we go on to a little further, and we have Dr. Martin Luther King, who took the abolitionist movement a little step further because it hadn't, the Civil War just hadn't accomplished what, what the people that were abolitionists wanted to accomplish. And so here's someone that takes their Christian faith and is putting it into practice. Then we come up to our own day. You know, we've got, we've got a lot of things going on in church where we are out uh, demonstrating Christ's love to the community. Uh, for example, the uh, going to Whispering Woods is an example of that. Then we have, have our coats and mittens and scarves and gloves those things going on at Christmas to uh, express our Christian love. So I would just like to emphasize that you really can't have a vital faith without both faith and works. Our faith should motivate us to do things to please God and to do good works. So, less indeed, be Christians who practice our faith through our works. Would you please uh, bow in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for the fact that you indeed loved us to the point that you wanted to bring salvation to us, and that by loving you, we will then indeed practice that love to our neighbors. We pray that as we go from here, Lord, that you would indeed help us to practice our faith and good works. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we pray that you would go with us as we leave this house of worship. May we practice our faith during the week. May we glorify you in our daily living. And may we find ways to express your love to those around us. We ask it in your name. Amen.